Welcome to the Hidden Driveway Show. I'm your host, Amu, and then joining me today, we have a very special guest, VHS Midnight Style. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is VHS Midnight Style, for those who don't know me. I'm based in Manchester, and I'm an artist, a rapper, and a producer. Yes, you are. And we're going to talk about some of that rapping and producing today in this interview. What a surprise. Um, but to get us started, is there anything that you would like to talk about? Something that I'd like to talk about is not just a little bit of a reminder to be kind to your friends, check in on your mates, make sure they're doing okay, because the time that we're living in, there's a lot of scary news. Just make sure that you're there for them when you need it, because you never know if a conversation is going to save a life. Mm -hmm. Be the person that you would want to have be there for you. That's a pretty good sentiment, I think. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, But... To talk about your music, though, so I remember first finding out about your music on Rate Your Music in 2023 when That Is America was briefly on the tread charts, which no longer is because apparently it's contentious on whether it is a tread album or not, even though we've talked about it, you said it is, they don't think they don't think so. So I guess it just means you're like stupid and wrong. Sorry. Absolutely. I mean, I made that with the intention of making the tread album. I'm sorry if some people don't want to accept that reality. But life goes on, the world keeps spinning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so while I didn't wind up listening to that album at the time... Um, you're... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the name VHS Midnight Style like, immediately stuck in my head. So I wanted to know, where did the name VHS Midnight Style come from? Of course, so when I came up with that name back in 2015, I was in a bit of a transitionary period with my music. At the time, I was making a lot of like EDM tracks inspired by artists from like Owlsler, like Skrillex and that. And I wasn't really feeling like I was making the best music that I could be. I wasn't satisfied with it. So I wanted to do a complete overhaul, but I was f- trying to find what the next sound would be. Anyway, another thing that happened in 2015 was something called Simpson Wave. For those who don't know, Simpson Wave was like a brief trending genre of video on youtube where people would take edits of simpson episodes and then they would juxtapose them against vaporwave music and one of the best known creators in the scene lucian hughes released one called sunday school and the track that was featured was blank banshee's teen pregnancy and that was the first real exposure i had to not just vaporwave music but specifically vapor trap music as soon as i heard that song i knew my trajectory going forward was to explore more of this genre, check out more vape trap artists and really learn how that genre was made and make it myself. And that's when I came up with the name VHS Midnight Style. And I'm not the best with names. Before I was VHS, I was making music under the name High Octane, which is quite generic. And for some reason, I went with the most generic vaporwave name I could think of. So VHS Midnight Style, that's how it came to be. And I've just stood with it since. I've been too lazy to change it. And now it's, you know, too late to turn back. Yeah, I think maybe as a a vaporwave artist, it might be more like quote unquote standard. Like I get where the VHS comes from with like all the like nostalgia and stuff. But I think it's like a rap artist name. It's very distinct. Also, what are your thoughts on like, you're talking about the Simpsons wave stuff. What are your thoughts on like those sad bar edits? Where to place like with, like <laughs> little peep over it? I I remember those. Yeah, there was a lot of like lo-fi hip hop edits with like you know the sad Bart in the sweater. Maybe they gave him like some of the little peep tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could appreciate it more from an ironic standpoint now. Like if I saw someone you know in the street and they're wearing a shirt and it's got a sad Bart on it, I'd be like, "You jokester! You absolute japester! You <laughs> a fellow tortured soul." <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> yeah i miss the era of the internet a lot though i it, it probably is nostalgia but like do you know who i'm um, like chris kogos is no no but he would do all these remixes where he would do like these cool like piano covers or he would use like the mario 64 like sound font he'd play like residence by home and, like a bunch of other stuff and that's how i found out about oh, like, wait, a lot like of music. using the mario 64 sound font yeah but like he'd be playing it like on his keyboard I've- Oh, okay. I think I have heard like some of those. Maybe not that specific user, but I distinctly remember hearing the 
Radiohead Idiot Attack version with the Mario Mario sixty four mm-hmm. songs. Yeah, um, I found out about like like YouTube poop music videos. Are you familiar with those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he yeah. did a lot of those too. I got like really into editing from those that yeah. that created the internet special to me. But to talk about your period of internet, so you've been releasing music online for nearly eight years at this point. And it seems like you're able to completely evolve and reinvent your sound with each project you drop. Having released projects in the style of wave, hip hop, and even dark ambient, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, so I wanted to know, who are some of your biggest influences for your production and your vocals? I'd say in terms of what I'm doing currently, I've taken a lot of inspiration from a lot of UK producers like Vegan, who you might know as a producer for Frank Ocean's Blonde, but he's done some really good solo material. He's got this like sort of very electronic scattershot sound. He'll have like whole songs like Breakdown. It's really interesting stuff and I'll take a lot of inspiration from it. And in terms of my vocal work, I didn't start using vocals until late 2020. The reason for that was I wasn't that comfortable with using my vocals. I didn't feel like people wanted that out of my music. But then in 2020, I listened to a song called Team Edward by Neat Computer. And hearing him, it just gave me that boost that I needed to start using vocals because he uses quite a high register, whispery sort of breathy delivery much like I do in my music so I knew if there was an audience for that music that I had to you know push myself to put vocals into the work that I make but of course I was I've always been listening to artists like Blade and Young Lean who have very unconventional vocal delivery styles so they've also been quite an inspiration to the music that I make Mm -hmm. do you think you'd ever try like screaming in your songs just feel like the I, don't, I think I'm too I'm too polite. <laughs> I have got I have however got a song that's in the the wheels of bureaucracy where I was collaborating with a producer who's also quite unconventional. And what we did was like at the start of the bar, I took a sample of me like actually breathing into the microphone. And it works really well in context to their production. And I think that inspiration came from Injury Reserves Hoodwinked, which was like a Lucy single released in like 2019. And that uses like a similar effect. So that must have just been in my head. Mm-hmm. But what are your thoughts on um, like by the time I get to Phoenix? It's an album that I liked when I listened to it. I can't come back to it because it's, it's quite an emotional listen because for me, I actually had the pleasure of seeing Injury Reserve live in 2019 and I got to meet um, all three of the members. They were really nice, even though I snuck into the sound check, <laughs> which I didn't intend to, but I was just happy to be there. So their music's always been really personal to me. So an album like that, really, really well produced. It's just, it takes a lot for me to listen to it. But the self-titled and the EP before that, they are like some of my all-time favorite rap releases. Yeah, hearing like Superman that for the first time was like mind-blowing to me because I didn't even know you could make music like that. Mm. That one's also chilling because I know they made it like before Grog's Pass, but like the way it gets like recontextualized is like really like unsettling. It is. And it reminds me a lot of A Tribe Called Crest when they released their final album, Thank You For Your Service. I think that was the name of it. And Fife Dog had passed away before the album was finished, but he'd recorded a lot of verses for it, so they kept them in as a sort of tribute for him. So I think it's quite a similar thing that Injury Reserve did. I've I, I just remembered the name of the EP, Drive It Like It's Still. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Floss is my favourite by them. I bumped it a lot during COVID. It has got some classics. Oh, shit. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you're talking about like Meat Computer. And then I know you've worked with PK Showboy from Fax Gang. So were you into that whole like hyper pop, like Digicore scene when that was a big thing? Not when it was at its peak. No. A lot of the connections that I do have in that scene are people that I've met through completely different like circles who just so happen to us be in that Digicore scene. Mm-hmm. Like um, PK Showboy. I-, I knew them quite well. 
because we were both in this like experimental club Discord server for a while called um, CXD, which focuses on like club music that's like outside of the mainstream, um, like a lot of deconstructed club or hard drum. Um, and I knew them from that. So I got the feature from them just because they did a post saying that they were with commission. So I saw the opportunity and I took it and I'm really pleased with contributions that they provide for that track. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it's different for me because I was like first getting in, like not first getting into, but I was getting more into like production at the time. So hearing all the like Jane remover like beats and like that whole scene was just like super inspiring to me. I tried making beats like that for a long time, even though I never, I don't think I ever did the style justice, but I've always really wanted to work with people from that scene. Yeah, I think to be honest, I'm, I was on a lot of different production wave like at the time i was making a lot more like club music rather than you know high pop or digital and that was just like the music that i was listening to at the time like i was listening to a lot of the high pop and the digital but for me that wasn't where my inspiration and my focus was at that time Mm -hmm. a more recent focus here is though so on your most recent full album kaiman and there's a song on it called sometimes gummy on it and I feel this answer might be a little interesting just because you're from the UK, so there's different things over there. But what are some of your favorite candies? Okay. So I'm going to put you on to some classic British sweets. If you go to any like a supermarket, you need to get, they're called um, rhubarb creams. And they're like these hard candies, well, sweets, as I was saying. And they've got this rhubarb flavor, and then there's like a, a creamy as well they're sometimes called rhubarb and custards because it's like a custardy flavor mm-hmm. and humbugs underrated but they're like a nice like minty creamy sweet mm-hmm. yeah i don't think we have anything like that over here now i think about it i'm more into yeah you've got you've got more like taffy type stuff haven't you like more soft soft sweets yeah i mean you've got like Werther's originals in the u.s haven't you yeah i'm yeah. more into the like like the song name, I'm more into like gummy stuff. So like gummy worms, like peach rings. That's that's for my heart wise personally. I'm not a big like chocolate guy. I, I do like chocolate, but I don't like um Cadbury's, like dairy milk. I much prefer like dark chocolate, like 70%. We've got this really nice brand here called Green and Blacks. And they do like some of the best chocolate you'll ever like taste in your life. Mm-hmm. It's lovely stuff. Okay, well, if I'm ever out there, I might have to try some. And speaking of, there I'm ever out there. Um, so one of your most popular albums is called That Is America. And the first song on it is actually called Living in America. But as we know, you're in the UK, right? So what are some places around the world that you'd love to visit? So I was quite blessed in 2023 to take a trip to Boston. To meet a lot of um, friends that I've made through Discord over the past like five years. And for me, that was like such an important experience for me. But... I've got so many more friends in America that I'd like to visit who aren't in that part of the country. So I'd love to take a trip to somewhere in Texas, like maybe Austin. Yeah. And like, just like have an explore because I think Texas is a really interesting state. I know that's where you live. Yeah, I actually go to college in Austin. So if you're ever down there, my there have to we go. Out. And I'd say I'd also love to go to the Pacific northwest so like seattle and then maybe take a trip to vancouver because that's also part of america that i'm really interested in exploring Mm -hmm. so when you called the album that is america did you mean like all of north america or like the u.s specifically the reason for that title and it kind of links into the themes that i had in the album was it's it's a little bit political um but i kind of feel like our country is veering a lot into a more Americanized system. So we have the NHS, but it's getting more privatized. More services are getting cut off. Um, and I feel like to politics, it's getting much more intense. And there's much more of a A versus B. And especially a lot of the politics around, you know, trans identities. It feels a lot like our country is veering towards and obviously, I'm not trying to slag you off. It's not your fault, but it's like more towards an American mindset. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's been like especially polarized like the last like 10 years, I would say. Absolutely. And it's yeah. most frustrating because I feel like all the biggest issues are about things that don't affect the people that are making the legislation on them, like with abortion or with like trans rights and stuff. Absolutely. I mean, if you listen to anything that Nigel Farage says, he's always like creating fear, you know, fear of something that threatens your safety, you know, threatens you. He makes it personal. But in reality, you could be, you know, sitting on the bus, you know, maybe there's a trans person, two seats behind you. They're no threat to you or your livelihood. And I think people sometimes lose that perspective. Yeah, I think it's so silly. Like, they're like, they're putting drag queens in schools and whatever. And it's like, no, they're not. It's because they'll see like one video where yeah. I don't even know why like you bring your kids to that in the first place. But they'll take that one instance and then like just blow it up into something like that it's not and absolutely and it's just to instill fear for you to then either give them your vote or to buy their merchandise that's always how it ends up Mm -hmm. yeah and then are there any places like besides the u.s that you'd want to visit um in terms maybe a bit closer to home i'd love to visit denmark um because i do know people have come from denmark and they only have lovely things to say about the countries and the culture there so yeah i'd love to take a trip to copenhagen sometime maybe when i've got a little bit more money in the bank Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah my only experience with denmark was there was some kid in my class whose family was from there and they brought in these really good like i don't remember what they were called but they were these like sort of like chocolateish balls with this like like glazed texture over it and they were really good but I can't... I'll have to, if I do visit, I'll have to look out for them for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't think of what they were called, though. But that's like probably one of the best things I've like ever tasted. So, um, Moving on. So while it's not as present in your work today, the word farmer is used a lot in your older projects, um, which featured these like blue-style print covers. And while you've moved on from this aesthetic, your releases on streaming are still tagged with farmer industries, and even on the Kaiman cover art. I thought it was just a skeleton, but I look closer, and then I see that you have pharma industries within the within the like circle. So it's still like a very big part of your identity today. Mm. So what does pharma actually mean? Yeah, so for context, pharma industries is basically the name of my own like, I guess you call it like a vanity label. So the label I sell for Lee Sunder. But in terms of where pharma actually came from, it started with the first album that I released as VHS Midnight Style. So back in 2016, I released my first album called Exiting Little Farmer. And I can't remember what my thought process was, but it was meant to be like a corruption or like parody of Big Trouble in Little China. And then somehow it got to Exiting Little Farmer. But then fast forward to 2017, when I was making a follow-up album, which would be called New Farmer New Vision, which was similar in style to Editing Little Farmer, obviously improving the sound with, you know, everything that I'd learned over the years. And as I felt like it was somewhat of a sequel, and I called it New Farmer New Vision. And then I felt like after two albums, it kind of became like a series. So the next one was Cure for Farmer. Um, and then ever since then, I've kept the farmer name associated with my music. I guess it can create sort of like um, a cryptic or like mysterious feeling whenever you see the word being used. And that's something that I would associate with music that I produce. Mm -hmm. And were you ever interested in going into any sort of like medical field at all? Well, yeah. um, When I was a lot younger, I wanted to be a dentist. I don't know what inspired that career choice. Maybe I saw that they worked three days a week and they took home (laughs) a pretty hefty paycheck so maybe that's what inspired me but yeah life took me on a different path Mm -hmm. yeah i wanted to be a nurse when i was in like first grade and like you said i have no idea where they come from because that has nothing to do with what i want to do now but it's a respectable career choice (laughs) yeah i guess it's just like the was the idea of like helping people was that like the main thing behind it for you i think so yeah Mm -hmm. and then what was the reason for the like blueprint style coverage because those aren't like prevalent in your work anymore but that was a big thing for a lot of your older releases yeah so a lot of the older releases they have this monochrome or like you know blue and white art style um 
And yeah, as you said, it's sort of like meant to set like a blueprint or like um, a wireframe rendering of a building. And every album since in that style, I wanted to iterate on it and, you know, make it more complex, introduce, you know, new visual styles. Like I was learning a lot about Divering, which is like the technique where you use flat colour in like tiny, tiny amounts to like, you know, recreate shading. I'm sure other people can explain it better than I can. But introducing all these elements and making the album artwork more and more complex. And then it got to 2019 when I released my album Heaven is Other Places. And I felt like I kind of taken the art style to its, you know, extreme. And going forward, I wanted to sort of break free of that aesthetic and explore, you know, different color schemes or different, you know, styles. Mm -hmm. And I know you told me earlier that you've done like pretty much all your cover. I know the Kaiman cover is like an exception because you had your friend do the like patch design for it. Um, But would you ever consider doing like any like 3D modeling stuff for your cover art? Maybe. I mean, I I don't know. Potentially in the future. But for me, I feel like where my strengths are is creating 2D art. Um, so if I was to go into 3D, I do know very talented 3D artists like um, Astro Blur. He uses Cinema 4D for a lot of her artwork, which is quite impressive. For me personally, I still love the uh, like the look of a 2D cover, especially if it's illustrated well. But who knows? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I just thought to ask you were bringing up the like wireframe style and like I I was learning like Maya when I was in high school. And like wireframe is like a huge part of that and like all three mm. programs. That's why I thought to ask that. Maybe like a music video would be cool though, even though it'd be like a lot of work to It's funny that you mention that, because if you do go to my YouTube channel, I did actually make a lot of um 3D music videos. Maybe not so much now, but um I know I did for information NTK from Heaven is other places and echolocation from New Farm and New Vision. And the way that I made those music videos, <laughs> you're not going to believe this. I made them in Roblox Studio. <laughs> so what I did was I used like, you know, like the outline effect. So I used that to like emulate the wireframe visuals. And then I would use the cutscene editor plugin. So I create a lot of like, um, you know, like, tracking shots, like moving through co- corridors and hallways. And then I'd edit, uh, edit it all in post, so it matched the color schemes. But um, yeah, maybe a bit, a bit different from Maya. <laughs> mm-hmm. And do you have like a favorite Roblox game now, just that we're talking about Roblox? I was, I was a fiend for Lab Experiment. Like during the pandemic, I sunk an embarrassing amount of hours into that game. <laughs> I'm in a better place now. <laughs> What did you do in that one? Because I've never heard of that one. Have you ever played like Plates of Fate? Oh yeah, it's a similar concept. You're on a plate, and then like different events happen. There was one I was into in middle school where it was like that concept, but with like different kinds of like bombs that would drop in this area, and you had to like mm. survive for a certain amount of time. And then I was a big, I was a big like survive the. It wasn't survive the disaster. No, it was survive the disasters because there's that one and the natural yeah. disasters. Yeah, because natural disasters is that's the one where you're on the island where I survived the disasters. That's like it's kind of like the Roblox default place. Yeah, with the house, like different events. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, that was like a very foundational game for my childhood. I think I remember my brother mm. would play like I would watch him play, and then he would blast like a Jacob Satorius song. If you remember that, <laughs> like while you yes. play it. Um, but speaking of playing some music. So you just released your new collab EP with Dreeks called D&D, and it's a personal favorite of mine in your catalog. So I wanted to know, what was the process of working on it like? So the way that that album, well, that EP came about was at the start of 2024, I was applying to a lot of promoters in the Manchester area because it was my resolution to really make a push on putting myself out there a bit more in terms of the more local scene. Um, and one of the labels that got back to me was called Mutualism, who are run by Ice Boy Violet, Ryan, and BFTT. And they really like my track 3CC33C. 
from the Cayman, which are created with Dreeks. And they had the idea of me releasing a full collaborative project with Dreeks. So a lot of it was just sending stems to and fro, you know, through Discord. And a lot of it was from Dreeks' um, 2023 album, which is evidence that we existed at some point in time. I think that's the titles. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and that, that was like leftover demos. And what I did was I took those and I repurposed them into completely new tracks, added my vocals, and that's how you got the project today. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was cool that you went for a more like melodic approach with this one that I feel like you generally do. So was there a reason mm-hmm. for that? I think that's just Streak's influence because a lot of their work, if you listen to it, is really melodic. There's a lot of arpeggios and chord progressions that they utilize in their work and i do use melody in my own music but maybe not to the extent treeks does that's just from their influence in the production Mm -hmm. and what was the reason for the the title now i've got a legal explanation and then an explanation i can't explain for legal reasons but the legal one is it's mine and Dreeks' name. So D for Daniel, D for Dreeks. Mm-hmm. No other explanation. Okay. <laughs> I, I know the um, the first song is called Dungeons and, and you don't know what the second word is. You is don't it? know what it is. It's Dude, like, it can be mystery. anything. It's like an unfinished symphony. You're just going to have to guess what the last few notes are. Mm hmm. So I know that there's no correlation to it whatsoever, but were you into Dungeons and Dragons at all? I wasn't personally, um, but I did feel like with a lot of the songs that I was making, there was kind of like a fantasy theme to them or, you know, elements of magic in terms of like the lyrics and the sound. So it, it made sense to sort of theme it around that certain board role playing game which you've mentioned but is potentially not correlated to yeah you know i think honestly they probably named it after your ep i think they did and um, i'll i'll be telling my legal team about that because i think in like maybe <laughs> like a hundred years that'll be considered one of the best projects of all time that's like a huge pillar for society and then somebody went back in time with their time machine and named it that i think so you know you, you can never you can never know these things. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons was like a really big like stepping stone for me, like personally. I know this isn't like very like, usual, but I really didn't hang out with people outside of school that much until I was like a it was the summer before my senior year of high school because my um friend started a D and D group and we meet at the library like every week over the summer. And that was the first time I'd really like started hanging out with people. And I think that opened me up a lot more like socially. So I'm very thankful for that, for that game, for that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are given this impression by media that when you get to high school, you have to be this like social butterfly where you have to go out drinking at house parties every Friday and you have to, you know, be in like 50 million social clubs. And in actuality, you go to high school and you're there for like from like eight till four you're shattered and you just want to go home and sleep. Mm -hmm. And what was your experience with like the UK education system? Because I know like it's very different from how the US one is set up. It was all right. I didn't have any complaints about it. Um, I think I was just there at the right time. But the good thing with the UK system is the equivalent of the last two years in American high school is what we have as our college or our sixth form. So you choose you know, three subjects or a practical qualification that you're interested in. So you can just focus on what you're good at and you don't have to worry about other subjects that you kind of just have to endure, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just can't imagine because with the whole like GCSE system where you have to like decide what you want to like do for the rest of your like school career when you're like 14. Like I can't imagine Mm. that. It sounds like a big commitment at the time, but um, as long as you just get the grades, it, it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, did yours have any relevance to what you're doing today at all? Mm, kind of. 
I was a bit of a nerd. I did um, computer science. <laughs> but, um, well, we all use computers, so mm-hmm. it came in handy. Well, they don't ask me to code anything in Python <laughs> or Visual Basic because I'll have no clue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I was taking computer science classes when I was in high school. I did, like, CompSci 1 through 3, and I was really good at CS1, and then COVID happened, so I was taking CS2 online, and what happened was my friend started sending me his labs, so I didn't have to actually do the work, right? Oh. So I got the grade, but then at the end of the year, we had to do the AP test for it, and my teacher was like, oh, my kids always get fives, and then I went in there. I felt like I did like okay and the multiple choice and then I got to the free response where you have to write code. And this is what yeah. I remembered that oh yeah, I kind of don't know how to write code because I didn't do anything the whole year. So I put like brackets at the start and the bottom of the page and that was it. Oh, I got I got a one on it, so <laughs> can't have expected much better. Yeah, I always thought that was gonna be not my career, but as like a potential like backup, I guess. Because, like, I was really into Scratch when I was younger, so I thought that coding could have had, like, something there, but then I got more interested into, like, animation, and then that shifted to music, so coding just wasn't in the picture anymore. I mean, you could always become one of those, um, mm. what is it called? Is it called, like, Max? Where it's, like, that coding language that, like, proper, like sound design, like, freaks use. <laughs> well, I know it's, I've... like, Max for SMP or something. I know I've seen videos where people are like coding their like set visuals like during their set. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it might be something along those lines. Mm-hmm. We'll just have to do like an editor's notes. Um, what is VHS rambling ram- ram- about? <laughs> um, and then have you performed live ever? I know you did like an NTS set with Dreeks, but like an in-person show. I know that was pre-recorded, so I guess it doesn't count. But I'd, I'd love for the opportunity to perform live. As I said, 2024, that's really my ambition that end of the year, I'd love to schedule just like any sort of live performance. But problem is there's like a circle of live promoters and people that you have to know. And for a long time, I wasn't in that circle. So I am, I'm making traction now this year, but I think I've got a bit of a journey to go. Mm-hmm. And do you think you would do like a, like a DJ set kind of? live performance or would you do like a like a vocal one i do a vocal one because I've, I've never done a live dj set before everything i've done it's me arranging the tracks in fl studio so i know it's like a different workflow to if you had something like tractor like where you have to mix the tracks yourselves in real time mm-hmm. also i don't know why but i always thought you used ableton for some reason like there wasn't a reason for it but i just assumed that's what you used a lot of people have said that that's I'm not quite sure where that's come from, but no, I, I use FL Studio. I'm a little bit fruity, as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it might, at least for me, it might be because of, are you familiar with Bootleg at all? Yes. Yeah, okay, because I feel like his Blizzard EP sounds kind of similar to a lot of your work, like Sonically. I know he, I know he uses Ableton, so that, I think that's where I made that mm. connection. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm um, speaking of the D and D project though. So you have a song off of it called "Car Crashes," and well, that's a pretty reasonable fear to have. Are there any like irrational things you're afraid of, like bugs, for example? This is dangerous information to put out on the internet, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, for the longest time, I was absolutely terrified of the DVD album cover for Tim Burton's Corpse Bride, and it was—I was only like six years old. Um, I must have seen it one time and it shook me up. But it was at the point where every time I entered the HMV, which is like a, a CD in the DVD shop, I had to close my eyes as I, as I was walking down the DVD aisle just so I wouldn't see this film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, luckily I've grown out of it. I have a greater appreciation for Tim Burton's filmography. Yeah, okay, you being six makes more sense. For, I, I don't know what it looks like, so I'll, yeah, I'll have like to put it on screen child. afterwards. But <laughs> <Six guys>. <laughs> <laughs> no, In um the Chapter 226 interview, I was talking about how I was afraid of the um the monkey from Toy Story 3, if you've seen that. Yes. But yeah. I put the, I can, I I put the audio of him screaming like, while I was talking about it. <laughs> so I'm sure they probably jump-scared somebody. <laughs> yeah. 
that was a freaky ass film for no reason. Yeah, like similar to you. I was like, I think five when it came out, and I was watching it in like a drive-in movie theater. So the screen is gonna be like ginormous, and then there's just this giant monkey that's like yelling, and it's pitch black everywhere outside. Mm. So yeah, that was definitely a big fear for mine. Um, That's a question I have about driving movie theaters. What if you're in the back seat? How do you watch the film? Well, I think you just wouldn't be in the back seat. Is the thing? Because I'm imagining if you're like a child and you're in the back seat and you've got those, you know, two front seats covering your view. And then you've got your roof. You're going to struggle to understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I've only been to one like twice, I think. The first time it was just me and my dad. So I was in the passenger seat, even though I was like five. I don't think I was yeah. allowed to like be in there when we were driving there. But once we got there, I sat in there. So my parents always made me use like booster seats and stuff for like way longer than I needed to. And then I think I saw The Amazing Spider-Man 2 the other time I went. And like we we like park we like drove in backwards, so then I was watching it from like the back of the van, and then we had um, a CD player that could connect to the radio, so like we listened through that. Oh. I know when I got home, I tried listening to more movies off of that, but I didn't realize that it was like location based, so it was just yeah, like it really would have only had like a small radius. Yeah. yeah. All right. So very anticipated segment coming up and. It, this is our third time recording this video, so in the previous one, I don't know if the same course of events will happen, but a certain somebody won. But so if he loses this time, I don't know what, what we're gonna say because like he's better than me, but like is he better than me this time for the actual recording? I don't know. I've been training. I've been shadow <laughs> rock paper scissoring. It's <laughs> so mm -hmm. like walk you, but I'm like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I beat Alfred Morose in the last episode, and I'd like to continue my streak. So can we play okay. Rock, Paper, Scissors? Best two out of three? I think we can make that happen. Okay. Rock, Paper, Scissors, Shoot. Okay. Oh, Ooh. strong start. Rock, Paper, Scissors, Shoot. Okay, we tied. Ooh. Rock, Paper, Scissors, Shoot. Oh, okay, we're tired. Okay, okay. That was the triple scissor play. <laughs> I didn't even pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when we were doing this earlier, uh, me and VHS tied, like, I think, like, four times in a row before we got... Five times Five in a row. times in a row, yeah. yeah. Um, So, I guess we just know each other's minds now. Cause we're we two in sync. Yeah. Uh, All right, it's the deciding one. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay. Oh, okay. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot, tied. Ooh. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot, tied again. Oh, tied again. Oh. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot, tied again. Ooh. 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 Rock, paper, scissors, shoot, tied again. So I can't have any of it. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. I beat you. So, but for the, for the record, we're like even skill level because in the previous recording in this, which unfortunately got deleted due to various reasons, he did win. So hey, what should we do next one wins? Oh, next one win. Okay, I think that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay. Oh, I still won. There we go. Ooh. You your streak continues. Mm, mm, mm. Give us a bit of a joke. Mm -hmm. But so I've been talking about this in like a couple of videos now, but I want to make this like, um, I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of everybody that's won and lost. And I want to make like a tier list once I've done like this for a year where I power scale everybody. But you'd be okay. a special case because you actually did win once. You'd place a lot higher than you would have from this but show. But of course, then you sabotage that recording and look at the draw what yeah can I say? purposely put well, malware then. on my computer so i couldn't upload it no nah, happens to us yeah that's how you know i'm dedicated to these because if i if i can't win nobody can exactly mm -hmm. uh, moving on though so you've worked with artists like pk shellboy of fax gang bpiv and have an entire ep with streaks as i stated before so who are some other artists that you'd love to work with i'd love to work with 
White Armor. He's like one of my favorite producers out of the, you know, the Drain Gang slash Sad Boys Collective. Of course, I also love Young Sherman's and Young Goods production as well. Any of those, really. Speaking of collectives, I'd also love to do something with Working on Dying, especially Falls and Noogie Main, who are easily like my favorite producers out of the group. I was speaking to you earlier about how That Is America came to be. And at the time, I was listening to a lot of tread music for the first time. And one of the earliest releases that I listened to was Forza and Ugi Main's World Tread Mix, which is like this eight minute DJ set. It's like, it's bed up and it's chaotic. And it's just everything that I love about the genre. So any opportunity to work with them, I'd be grateful for. And also John Glacier, who's this um, musician in the UK. I love her work, especially with Vegan, who I mentioned before. So any opportunity to work for mainly, like, maybe as like a producer, I'd be definitely up for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think I can picture all of those working pretty well. Especially, I was saying John Glassier in my head. But I guess that's wrong, or maybe maybe it's not wrong. I don't know. But John Glacier, I'll just say how you said it. I can definitely see her like lining up well with your production, especially off that one album she has. I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one with the like starry looking cover. Shiloh. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see it. And I know she's worked with people like Evil Gianni also. So, yeah, because she had a like a mini album with Surf Gang. So, yeah, yeah, I think she had that, and then she appeared on that. Um, I think it's called like Heaven's Gate that came out this year. That big album, yeah, yeah like Evil Gianni dropped. Yeah, yeah. And then were you into like Five Finger Posse at all for Tread stuff? Because that's like my favorite stuff from Tread. Oh yeah, that's just like that's textbook like Tread, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I did actually include one of their songs, um, Link Up, from, God, the names escape me. It's something in the trenches. Oh, Trapped in the Trenches, right? Trapping in the Trenches. Trapped in the Trenches. It's because I get mixed up with um, Oogie Main and My Five Gods, Trenches to Riches. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Trapped in the Trenches. And um, I included that in the NTS mix that you talked about earlier. So it's quite funny to give that music a platform and, you know, such an institution like NTS. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Five Finger Posse, definitely an essential artist. I'd also say uh, Lord Vizier, who's done a lot of mixtapes with Lord Unknown, who's actually a British head producer. And of course, I'd also say Wi-Fi God, who I mentioned earlier. Loads of classic albums in the catalog. Mm-hmm. I think Intergalactic by Young Mojo is probably my favorite. That's a really good Shutter's album, yeah. 24-7, I'll be trapped out. Like, come on yes like that's like my textbook definition for like tread 808 patterns i always try to like mimic what he did with that because it just fits so perfectly oh another one this just comes to my mind when i was thinking about the ntx mix but um lil sebel 1600 who i work with on barclays did an ep with raid who's a tread producer called tread setters and that is well worth listening if you can find it Mm -hmm. i know we were talking about the tread charts earlier but I know there's a lot of like Russian tread that's like mm. popular in there that I haven't listened to any of it, so I need to go check that out because I'm curious what they did with yeah, it. Yeah, I know there's Whitener, I think that's his name. He's the one that comes to mind, and I think there is like a little bit of like a Russian scene going on. I don't know. It's, the Russians love their like their American hip hop. Mm hmm. Well, they do like a lot of like drift funk stuff now too, right? So. Yeah, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they just like that like better. harsh like sound because Tread can yes. be really harsh, especially like um, I don't know if you've listened to any of it, but like do you know Black Smoke Rises? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. A lot of her Tread stuff is like really like harsh and aggressive. That's just her style. Yeah, because it's almost like power noise inspired, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of a based Decepticon Nine K. I think that's their name. But they are one of the strangest tread producers. Um, I forgot what an album they did was. It was like on the R.E.M. charts for ages. But it's like so disorientating. Oh, is it Max like, Out Money? Max Out Money, yes. That's like one of the most extreme examples of tread I can think of. And also an artist called Fridge. You can have a lot of music to catch up on. He did an album called Dark Angel. And that's like really frantic, lots of like chaotic energy. I love that album. 
Yeah, with Max of Money, it's like, I feel like every song is like low-key the same, but it's like, nothing else sounds like that though, so I think it's okay, because yeah. like, it's just like a fever dream. That's an accurate description, yeah. Yeah, I saw recently they put it on a streaming, I don't think it was before, but... No, because I think I listen to it on SoundCloud. Yeah, I'm sad though, because um, like 1990 Morg had like one of his like old tread projects on Spotify. And I tried to re-listen recently, and it's not there anymore. Okay. Um, so last year, you released a song called Stargazing slash Icy Stars. And you might remember that the first song in Travis Scott's Astral World was also called Stargazing. Um, that album released in 2018, around the time that I first started producing. So I wanted to know, what's some advice that you would have for somebody that's just starting out with music? On like finding their sound? Because I feel like you've done a very good job with that. Yeah, um, because I started producing in 2010, 2011, that time. And at that time, a lot of the music I was making, it was very, like, formless. It wasn't structured well. It was, like, it would go on for, like, nine minutes. It was not good music to listen to. But what I would say to you as a producer is if you feel like your music's like that, where you sat in front of FL Studio and you spend, like, five hours on a track and it doesn't sound right, keep going because there's like a point of inflection where the more you produce the more experience you get with your tools you hit that point and your music just starts to make sense and that's the best way i can describe it. your music makes sense mm -hmm. and the only way you can get that is as i said practicing just actually making music mm -hmm. but also searching up a lot of people that you enjoy the music of Try and search for any production streams that they make and have a look at their workflows because you might learn about tools in FL Studio or Ableton that you wouldn't have been aware of that you can then incorporate into your own music. So as important as it is to learn everything about the software, you also just need to understand how other people use it and you can use that knowledge to your advantage. Mm hmm yeah, I told you this earlier, but I feel like even though you've covered so many different styles of music over the years, it's all very distinctly VHS Midnight style, no matter what genre you're taking on. So I think I think that's good advice because like you're influenced by a lot of different people and that that shows in your work, but it's still like one cohesive vision that mm -hmm. you have. Uh, and if I had to give my own advice, I would say like work with other people because you learn so much just from like talking to other artists about how they do music yeah because i feel like i wouldn't have been able to make to have made dnd on my own that album was only possible through dreeks's contributions it's just one of those cases where the value is greater than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. i'm sure people more around my age have probably this experience you're a little bit older so maybe not you as much but like growing up with discord like having those like voice calls where people screen share and you can just like watch them work was like so important yeah absolutely yeah i've definitely i've definitely learned a lot just from watching other people on discord vcs mm -hmm. but yeah that's like invaluable experience for me i think and as the episode comes to a close is there anything you'd like to give a shout out to yeah of course um i'd like to give a shout out to greeks obviously they were instrumental in making D, &D such a pleasure to listen to and love you to work with i would fully advise you to listen to both of their albums it's just like very solid like progressive electronic music dips into like trance or like hyper pop if you're a big fan of one of tricks point never's earliest stuff you'll get a lot of enjoyment out of it and of course a big thank you to mutualism and all the team involved there for supporting me and dreeks and giving us a platform to share our project. And then, of course, a big thank you to everyone at Earthium, which is like a Discord community of musicians I'm in, who I've known for like some of them like seven, eight years. And then, if I've not said your name, thank you to you. You might not even have done anything, but you know what? That's a free thank you. Get it while you can. Yeah, the VHS Midnight Star co sign is very, very valuable. So put that on your CV. <laughs> mm -hmm. so shout out all those people and shout out vhs midnight style so first of all i just want to thank say you. thank you for being such a big trooper during this process because 
this is the third time we've tried recording this. I changed up some of the questions from the initial interview because I didn't want to have them do the exact same thing over again. And I feel really bad that it's been this difficult to get this set up, but I'm glad. I don't want to jinx it, but I'm glad that we were finally able to get. Yeah, but I don't. I you know I'm not even gonna say anything because I don't want to get deleted again. Um, but yeah, I'm just glad we were able to get this in. This is really fun to do. Um, oh, thank you for having me. Of course, yeah. Um, all those links will be in the description down below if you want to go check him out. Um, and you definitely should, especially his new EP D and D. No relation to Dungeons and Dragons whatsoever. Please go no. check it out. And uh, yeah, I'm Amu. This has been the Hidden Driveway Show. Goodbye. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say something. No.